Good morning, everybody. Um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Enrique Roy. I work at uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, the university, Beatriz and uh, Alberto, for the invitation to be here. Um, it's been a very interesting discussion the last couple of days. And uh, having grown up in Santa Barbara, any excuse to uh, come to the West Coast is a good one. So um, I'm glad to be here. Um, just really quickly, I want to mention um, just really quickly, I want to um, tell you um, who USAID is. And uh, for those of you who don't know, we were created in 1961 by President Kennedy. Um, we're the main federal agency primarily responsible for administering civilian foreign aid. Um, we operate in Latin America, Asia, Africa, and Europe. And our mission statement is to um, eradicate uh, global poverty and build strong and resilient uh, democratic societies. As a part of that, uh, we have a security initiative um, that operates in Latin America primarily um, in four um, regions, uh, Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, and Colombia. So I'd like to start off with this uh, quote from President Obama that he made back in uh, 2011, which kind of, in a nutshell, describes uh, USAID's um, citizen security initiative in the region. And basically what he says here is that we'll never break the grip of the cartels and the gangs unless we also address the social and economic forces that fuel criminality. We need to re reach at-risk youth before they turn to drugs and crime. And so we're joining with partners across the Americas to expand community-based policing, strengthening juvenile justice systems, and investing in crime and drug prevention programs. So for USAID, as part of the larger U.S. government uh, initiative in, um, in Latin America, of which much, most of the attention is given to the drug and addiction efforts and law, law enforcement, we are applying different uh, development tools and approaches to dealing with the issue of citizen security. And so as mentioned, we're operating in these four areas in Latin America. For the most part, USAID's efforts focus on um, what we refer to as social prevention of crime and violence and what others might refer to as pacification. Um, this is how we complement the law enforcement efforts that are carried out by our State Department colleagues through the uh, International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Bureau. Um, the reason why we're investing in social prevention as part of our work is because we've seen solid evidence for um, its impact. Um, we see the importance of needing to focus on underlying risk factors for why youth get involved in gangs and drug cartels to begin with. And we also see it as a way of easing the pressure on the prison system. As mentioned yesterday, I think by Rafael, um, the prisons in uh, El Salvador, for example, at, are at 300% over capacity. Obviously, that's not sustainable over time. And what we've seen in Central America um, primarily is that the Montevideo approach has not been effective in reducing homicide rates. Currently, the region has uh, the highest homicide rates in the world. Um, Honduras topping out at number one. Uh, followed by El Salvador and uh, Guatemala. In addition to the work that uh, we're doing on the prevention, uh, prevention side, I also want to mention that we're investing pretty heavily in the justice sector as well as a complement to the work that we're doing in the communities. Um, I think also mentioned yesterday by Eduardo was that um, you have to focus on the institutional side as well to ensure that there's trust between citizens and the police and that impunity is addressed um, and that the justice sector actually is able to prosecute criminals. Um, currently, we have some interesting programs going on in the region. One is uh, in Guatemala, where we're providing support to the high-impact courts there that are prosecuting high-level cases um, as a support to the UN uh, CSIG Commission. And we also have a very interesting model there called the 24-hour courts, which uh, if you've had a chance, if you haven't had a chance to visit, I would highly recommend it. Um, it's an initiative that's been spearheaded by the current Attorney General, uh, Pasi Pas, and it's focused um, on uh, domestic violence, uh, provides sort of a one-stop shop for uh, women who have been abused, who can have access to services, to a prosecutor, to uh, legal uh, counseling, um, et cetera. And so Guatemala being a country where domestic violence is also um, at uh, one of the highest in the region as well, this is an important initiative to address that issue. We also have uh, programs that are uh, working on community policing as well um, in Mexico and Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Again, these efforts complement uh, the more traditional law enforcement um, investigative training that happens. We're more focused on building the relationships between communities and police 
uh, to improve those levels of trust that are sorely lacking in many of these countries. Now, all the work that we're doing, obviously, as mentioned, is focused on building the resilience of communities to resist um, the negative effects of crime and violence and um, the presence of gangs. Obviously, a lot of the work that we're doing is focusing on um, offering opportunities, alternatives to youth um, in these communities. And so we have programs, for example, that offer um, out of school um, opportunities like our Centros de Alcance, which are basically low cost community centers that we operate uh, throughout the region. Um, in Central America, and we also uh, work closely with the government of Mexico to support their uh, community centers as well. Uh, the work that we're doing there is primarily in uh, Tijuana, Monterrey, and Ciudad Juarez. Now, all these efforts, um, in order obviously to be sustainable, we're working closely with uh, local municipal governments throughout the region, primarily to help them develop local prevention plans so that the resources for these programs actually start going into their budgets. Um, it's an effort that we coordinate also with uh, national governments as well to try and develop national policies on prevention so that, um, again, the resources are there, but also the commitment and the political will to actually invest um, in these types of programs are present. Historically, the region has been more inclined, as many here know, to focus more on the hardline law enforcement approaches. And so we've seen a positive trend in the other direction to find a better balance between the social prevention work and what's being done on the law enforcement side. We're definitely not advocating that prevention um, you know, be sort of the, once, the, the magic bullet here um, by any means. We see that it has to be a combined effort. And also we're doing some interesting work with uh, crime observatories as well to collect better data at the local level that can be then used for policymakers to inform the decision making around where to invest resources. So for example, efforts at uh, what we call crime prevention through environmental design to improve public spaces, to clean up graffiti, those kind of efforts have been seen as also um, leading to reductions in crime and violence as well. So again, a lot of these programs are focused on at-risk youth, where we see that there's a youth, bul youth bulge in the region, many, many youth exposed, exposed to a host of individual risk factors, um, situational risk factors. And so providing them with alternatives is a key to a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, we're also looking at um, getting more involved in what we call secondary prevention, which I'll explain a little bit more later, and juvenile justice. Obviously, with the overcrowding that's happening in many of the prisons, we understand that this problem happens earlier on, and so if you've had the chance to visit any of, any of these uh, juvenile detention centers in the region, they're pretty miserable, horrible places. Um, and so a lot of the problems start early on. So we're working with governments in the region also to reform the juvenile justice system, but also look at ways of providing alternatives to incarceration. And we're also looking at ways that we can involve youth uh, more in advocating for prevention policies. Um, USAID has a youth and development policy that uh, we launched uh, about a year and a half ago. And so we have a mandate to look for ways that we can involve youth more in our development programs, but also in some of the advocacy efforts that we're doing around some of our development work. And so we have been supporting an interesting uh, youth movement against violence in uh, Central America. And below are, below are some of the activities that they've done. The, um, the bus against violence here was an interesting initiative where they took uh, politicians and private sector leaders to some of the hotspot communities where they're working so they could actually see what was happening on the ground. It's a way of sensitizing um, these folks to some of the problems facing these communities. As part of these efforts that uh, we're currently implementing, we also have a pretty um, extensive evalu impact evaluation that uh, we're doing through uh, Vanderbilt University in uh, four countries in the region, in Central America, and also including Mexico. And this is a three-year study that we're conducting, looking at uh, approximately 33 treatment communities and 67 control, exclusively focusing on sort of USAID interventions around prevention and community policing. Um, the preliminary results that we've gotten back from El Salvador and Guatemala are promising in the sense that they're showing that the, the programs that uh, USAID is doing in those treatment communities is having an impact in terms of improving trust uh, between citizens and the police, but also uh, resulting in some reductions in, um, in homicides and other crimes. So we are the only U.S. agency um, internationally that is doing this kind of impact evaluation, and so we're very excited to be able to disseminate the results once we have the final study completed. 
I also want to mention that uh, we have a pretty um, aggressive learning agenda as well that we're trying to learn from different cities here in the U.S. as well as abroad in terms of um, different efforts that have worked to, to deal with gang problems but also with uh, reducing crime and violence. Um, back in uh, 2012, USAID signed a MOU with the city of Los Angeles um, to learn from them some of their experiences with uh, dealing um, with gang reduction, in particular uh, secondary prevention, which is a way of targeting those youth who are at a much higher risk of getting involved in gang violence. Um, in collaboration with the University of Southern California, we've um, had several visits to the region to adapt a tool called the uh, Youth Service Eligibility Tool, which uh, is basically a survey instrument that's applied to youth to evaluate on a scale of nine risk factors how at risk are they of actually getting involved in a gang. So these are risk factors that range, for, uh, range from drug abuse to um, negative peer influence, uh, lack of parental supervision, impulsive risk taking, um, generational gang influence, et cetera. And so for LA, any kid who is, um, has been identified having four more risk factors is um, identified or selected for the secondary prevention program. It's a family model basically where they work with uh, the family system to change behaviors. And so we're looking at adapting this currently in Honduras and in uh, Mexico where we're piloting this initiative. And so part of this uh, learning agenda, we're looking at, again at ways of sharing best practices on municipal crime prevention models. We've done several study tours to Colombia and different cities in the US where we bring delegations from Mexico or uh, from Central America uh, to exchange lessons learned so that it's a two-way two learning that happens. Um, we have um, also sponsored various events uh, going back to 2011 and um, Actually, in a couple of weeks now, we'll be co-hosting with the World Bank and the uh, Violence Prevention Coalition of Los Angeles, the uh, third annual uh, Gang Prevention Intervention Conference in LA. So um, we're very excited about this opportunity. Um, it also will be um, a chance to do a study tour as part of that uh, conference as well. And then later on this year, we're looking at uh, hosting um, a conference in Guatemala on youth crime and violence prevention, also with the, uh, the World Bank as well. So in terms of, uh, you know, where do we go from here? What have we learned? Um, you know, we've been able to do a lot of interesting uh, public-private sector alliances on crime and uh, violence prevention, which, uh, again, is very positive because that uh, hasn't always been the case that the private sector has been interested and willing to get involved in these kinds of programs, but uh, there definitely is much more interest now. And so we're looking at ways that we can continue to attract the private sector to collaborate with USAID and host governments on these programs. Um, the issue of integrated strategy, which has come up a lot um, here in the last two days, is continues to be one of the major challenges for us at the international level. Um, oftentimes people feel like with primary prevention that that's enough, but uh, we're trying to um, advocate for also looking at secondary and tertiary prevention. Um, the whole issue of reentry and reinsertion for former gang members is something that currently really is not being addressed uh, in Latin America, and so that's something that uh, we're also very interested in, in promoting. Um, and then the you know, the collaboration and coordination with law enforcement uh, obviously continues to be a key, and so that's something that uh, we stress and reinforce in all our programs. The issue of uh, greater geographic fo focus, again, uh, something that's been mentioned here, how do we get to really those, those micro communities where a lot of the bad stuff is happening and really cater our interventions to that context on the ground. And then looking at uh, how do we target really, again, those who are at most risk for committing crimes. Again, while a lot of our focus has been on mainly primary prevention and hotspot communities, it's really, the issue now is like drilling down and really getting at those who are much, much, much likelier to, um, to commit crimes or get involved with gangs and cartels. And then the issue of coordination obviously is, uh, is key for us, especially working internationally, how we collaborate with uh, host governments, other donors. Um, there's a multitude of actors working in these countries from the World Bank to the IDB, the Germans, the Spanish, uh, host governments. And so coordinating all that um, foreign assistance is, uh, is critical as well. And then finally, the, the last issue here is, um, is one that um, we're becoming more keen on the issue of uh, changing behaviors and less on trying to change uh, gang identity. And this is something that we've learned from our working relationship with Los Angeles is that you know going in and telling somebody not to be a gang member is not really effective. And so how do we really address the issue of changing um, behaviors? And that again goes to the issue of secondary prevention where we're trying to be more focused on who we're actually trying to reach. 
So thank you very much. Look forward to the uh, Q&A.